Welcome everybody and thanks a lot for joining us for this session on domain specific processor design using ASIP designer. My name is Marcus Willems. I'm product marketing manager within Synopsys and I will take you through a brief introduction to domain specific processors and ASIP designer. And then Patrick Fabist, a field application engineer in the processor team, will take you to our processor design models featuring the RISC-V instruction set and how to extend them using various concepts, including the simple data path extension concept. Synopsys has a broad portfolio of processor solutions. Um, first of all, a very strong portfolio of processor IP ready to instantiate processors in the deeply embedded space in the security space, in the high-speed space, the newly released DSP family of VPX, and the embedded vision family. All of these processes also in a version for that is ISO 26262 certified for safety critical applications. We also offer a tool solution that allows you to design your own processor tailored to your specific needs. That's ASIP Designer. And we're, that's what we're gonna cover in today's presentation, how to use this tool to design your own specialized processor. Before going there, let's have a brief look at why there is such an interest to design your own domain-specific processor. This graph here um, might look familiar to many of you. Um, and it indicates the performance uh, that processor solutions have achieved over time. And there was a, um, a time that where the performance increase was simply coming by moving to the next technology node, by moving to higher frequencies, by moving to a more advanced memory architectures without doing any real modification to the instruction set or the processor architecture itself. Then, then we move to parallelizing these things, going to homogeneous multi-core designs, having multiple of these processes instantiated. But of course, also this came to a certain limit then when it was no longer a, a possible to, to parallelize the tasks in here. It was about that time, about five, six, seven years ago, that more and more designs moved then to heterogeneous multi-core designs where you have multiple processors with processes being tailored and specialized to a specific workload. And that is what we often refer to then as domain-specific processors. It's really about heterogeneous multi-core design with processors tailored to the specific needs. We often also refer to this as an application-specific processor because you're really tailoring it to an application. So consider this as synonyms. So an application specific processor is really about balancing the flexibility of a microprocessor with the performance of a hardwired data path. It's really about using a building such a processor when there, you cannot find standard processor IP for your requirements and when the fixed hardware is not flexible enough. It's really about balancing then the amount of flexibility and the amount of specialization. And that's the whole idea of domain-specific processor design, finding the right architecture. And you have many options available to you in order to define your architecture. Um, I'm not gonna go into any other detail here. It just is a wide range of options. And you as a designer need to decide which of these options apply for your specific problem. Of course, this then gives you the benefit of a domain-specific processor, which you can uh, summarize with the three Ps. It's about maximizing performance for your specific um, application. It's about minimizing power consumption for that task, while at the same time achieving the level of programmability that is needed and desired for that specific domain. So the three Ps uh, clearly illustrate the ACID benefits or domain-specific processor benefits. Well, with the benefits of a processor, a domain-specific processor understood, it's now to the thing like how to design these things. And let's have a look at processor design in, in um, how it used to be. There are multiple teams involved in processor design. And there is the application team that has the rough algorithmic spec 
um, uh, that that defines the payload that should run on the process unit. It hands it over to the architecture team that then thinks about a good architecture and has ideas on the instruction set and the microarchitecture, which then hands over this specification to the hardware team and the software tools team, because for a processor, definitely you also need to have a simulator, a debugger, ideally also a compiler. So it's only then when both teams are done with their delivery that it goes back to the applications team where they can then try this architecture with real application code. And hopefully all these ideas that evolved over time were then meeting the real requirements. Well, I said hopefully, because indeed it is a top-down flow and the feedback loop is at a very late stage in the design process. There's also very limited interaction between the teams. It's really these walls that are, exist between the teams, there is the risk of inconsistent interpretation of the spec by the hardware teams and the software teams. Overall, it's a long design cycle, which uh, results in missed business opportunities. What we need is an agile approach. It's really about turning down these walls between the teams and letting them operate in an interactive, in a continuous uh, cooperation mode. And that is what ACIP Designer enables. And this flow diagram on the right hand side, I would like to walk you through in the next five minutes. It all starts with specifying your processor in a processor description language that allows you to specify the instruction set and the data paths. And um, it comes with um, the description of the resources that you have, the instruction set grammar, and the behavior. It's a registered transfer language. Of course, no one would uh, like to start from scratch or will have to start from scratch. We are offering a wide range of example models written in this NML model, uh, modeling language for various kinds of architectures, including the RISC-V ISA implementations, which Patrick will cover in some more detail in the, in the second part of this presentation. So you see a wide range of example models all provided in NML in source code and available for you to modify and extend. So once you have this model, you can automatically, you click the button, you get a C compiler right away. And yes, even for your specialized architecture, we generate a C compiler. It's a unique capability of, of our tool set that we retarget the compiler to your specific architecture. And you get a simulator and the debug um, the environment. So you can, at a very early stage, take your application code get and, and profile it on your simulator and um, then identify what kind of modifications might be necessary. Because for a domain specific processor, it's absolutely crucial that you are spending enough time in refining the architecture to meet your requirements. And with this feedback loop, we call it the compiler in the loop approach because we always have the C compiler included here, this is possible. So you can explore multiple options, uh, multiple architectural alternatives in a very short amount of time. That's also when you're exploring all these options that I had explained earlier on parallelism and specialization. It's at this stage of the design flow. Then there is the aspect of RTL or hardware generation. From the very same model, you generate the RTL. All the information required for the hardware is included in the NML model, and we automatically generate fully synthesizable and, by the way, also very readable um, Verilog and VHDL code. And you can synthesize it and profile it again at any stage in your design process. So you can check for timing, area, performance, power consumption, so you can see if your domain-specific processor meets the targets that you have set. And again, you can go back to your NML model in this feedback loop, you make sure that you immediately get um, a uh, software development kit, the compiler and the simulator adjusted to any modifications. So it's really an iterative approach, a continuous integration approach that is enabled. And finally, we also support the verification of your design because it's a design process that you have to do. So verification is an integral part of the, that process. And we're providing formal checks, automatic generation of test programs, 
and um, full integration into system Verilog UVM based uh, test and uh, test benches. So it's really an agile approach that is being enabled between the different teams here. And um, um, the spanning, um, the tool automation is spanning all design disciplines. So all four quadrants here are covered. It's a continuous integration process, which is crucial for coming up with good designs and having feedbacks at any stage. So it's really shortening the design cycles. It's enabling teams for the first time often to do domain-specific processors because it also addresses this um, issue of um, having a software development kit at any point in time. So with this overview on the um, design flow, I would like to hand it over for Patrick, who's now going to cover um, um, the example models, in particular the RISC-V processor models that we are providing with the tool, and how to extend these models so that they turn into domain-specific um, architectures. Over to you, Patrick. Thanks, Marcus, for the introductory part of introducing the ACIP designer tools. Uh, as I said, I will now move into a little bit more details on uh, our RISC-V ISA models that uh, come for free with uh, ACIP Designer, and also the concept of uh, the simple data path extensions, because uh, data path extensions or ex instruction extensions are one of the, the key targets of, of the whole um, uh, RISC-V uh, uh, community and, and, and where we are going with this, uh, this RISC-V uh, uh, technology. And ACIP Designer, in fact, is uh, the ideal environment to design your own custom RISC-V ISA-based ACIPs because the tool flow will automatically follow. Uh, whatever changes you bring into the, the ACIP technology, um, the, tool flow, the tool will uh, adjust the compiler, um, assembler, linker, uh, ISS, uh, as Marcus explained. And ACIP Designer comes with a wide range of RISC-V ISA processor models, and they are all provided in source code. So it's easy to start from them as a jumpstart of your design and make your own derivative. And uh, for each of these de derivatives that you design, ACIP Designer will automatically generate a production level C, C++ compiler, simulator, debugger, and the RTL model, and the on-chip debug infrastructure, and they will remain all in sync uh, throughout your design flow. Here is an overview of the uh, risk 5 ACIP examples that come for free with the tool. I, I want to guide you slightly uh, through this. Uh, so we have two main categories. We have the risk 5 ISA models that uh, come with a 32-bit data path, um, and the ones coming with a 64-bit data path uh, with a three-stage pipeline, and a five-stage pipeline. So this, uh, I, you know, there's a, you know, quite some numbers here, uh, a nomen nomenclature of um, um, of different versions of the uh, risk 5 ISA models. I will guide you through them. So we start with the TRV32 P3, which is uh, our RV, which implements the RV32 IM uh, instructions. Uh, so they uh, support integer instructions, multiply instructions. But you have the options, and these are the F uh, versions here listed at the, at uh, the bottom of this box, uh, the 3F and the 3FX. We have also versions uh, which implement single precision floating point instructions. But on top of that, um, we have other derivatives which are depicted here with the X suffix, uh, which implement the compressed instructions. And then we're talking about the RV32 IM. C. But on top of that, we also, if you're, you're uh, interested in, in DSP type of application, then you have a, a number of instructions which are somewhat missing in the RISC-V ISA. Uh, then we have a, ver a version, uh, which is the X version, uh, implementing zero overhead uh, loops, uh, which are encoded in the custom tree opcode space. And then uh, also instructions with load stores with post modification address modes, which are then encoded in the custom zero and custom one opcode space. And those examples, they co-complete with also the on-chip debug uh, functionality. If we dive then a little bit in the microarchitecture, huh, I uh, 
I explained to you about the five stage pipeline, uh, fetch, decode, EX, uh, a memory access, and then a write back stage. But then the three stage pipeline, it only has uh, three stages. Uh, it implements a protected pipeline. So there are register bypasses uh, implemented when possible, uh, but uh, the, uh, the hardware will stall or create a bubble when the bypass is not possible. So there is an integer multiplier, there is an iterative in, uh, integer divider, and on the floating point side, we have used uh, design wear components from Synopsys to, um, to implement the fused multiply add uh, operation or instructions. Uh, also the comparator, comparator float to int, into float conversions. And on top of that, there is a floating point iterative divider and square root uh, unit uh, as part of the models. And as I said, they all come in uh, NML source code. Uh, and they provide you an ideal starting point to, uh, to make your own derivative. A little bit further details on the three-stage pipeline. I will not spend too much time on it, but this is the three-stage pipeline. So that's the, the 32P3, the 64P3, but also the, the float versions of it, um, at least, yeah, with the PPA part. Um, there is an, an AGU operational in the ID stage, and then we have a, a read, uh, modify, and the modification is the multiplier and the LU, and a write back, uh, all happening in the EX stage. So it's a read, modify, write uh, data part uh, for the three-stage pipeline version. For the, uh, the five-stage pipeline version, it's a little bit different. So the, the read's happening uh, here in the ID stage, and then we have an execute stage during the, the, the LU and the AGU. Um, um, but the multiplier is then, is then spread over two stages, and then the WB states uh, there, the write back to the register, register file is happening. So this gives you a, a little bit of um, view on the uh, microarchitectural details of the, the, the core that come for free with. On the performance numbers, um, so the features and, and, and benchmarks, I, uh, I will guide you a little bit to the uh, performances here. On the core mark side, um, we have the TRV 32P3, um, which we optimized, where we uh, run the compiler optimized for cycles or the, running the compiler optimized for code size. And then you see that we reach a very competitive uh, core mark number of 3.27 at a certain code size of 13K uh, locations. Of course, if you optimize for code size, code size will be drastically lower, huh? but you, you will give in on the core mark. Um, but then you see the uh, benefits um, of the uh, compact instructions, the zero overhead do loops, and the post modification load stored instructions, where you see that the core mark number is drastically going up um, compared to uh, yeah, the core without these ex extensions. And also the code size is, is drastically reduced uh, as, a as a cause of these additional instructions, but also as a cause of the uh, caused by the uh, compact instructions. And on the area side, yeah, uh, the frequency and, and area side, uh, we arrange, we get somewhere like between 25 to 39k gates at a max frequency of uh, 1.3 gigahertz. And then if you're going to the X version. Uh, that goes, of course, you know, the area goes slightly up uh, and the frequency uh, remains almost the same. But on the right hand side, you see a small diagram, a breakdown of, of the area. Where is the area spent? And then you see that uh, how the area is spent in the register file. You could, um, uh, yeah, you could reduce that area by, for, for instance, going to the E extension. Uh, the E extension of, of, of RISC V then uh, only has. 16 uh, general purpose registers instead of 32. That means you would halve the register uh, size by, you know, you would halve the register file, uh, saving a lot of area. And, and implementing that as a change on, on one of these uh, TRV models, it, it's a matter of, uh, yeah, of a few hours to, to do that. Then going to the floating point benchmarks, uh, there we added uh, single precision floating point instructions uh, based on design wear components as said. Uh, there you see that the core mark numbers are exactly the same, obviously, because core mark doesn't have any uh, floating point uh, 
uh, routines included. Uh, but then, yeah, an, a, a major difference is the max frequency, which goes from 1.3 gigahertz in, in, in the previous uh, benchmarks to, to yeah, 700 megahertz. And that is caused by the uh, multi, by the fused multiply, floating point fused multiply add, uh, which all has to be squeezed in one uh, read, modify, write cycle. Uh, that has a substantial impact on the frequency, uh, but still uh, very good. And here we are limited by the performance of the designware component, of course. The area goes up, obviously. And then on the right-hand side, you see the grayed out uh, pieces are the ones uh, from the integer core. Uh, the colored pieces are the additional areas uh, from the floating point register file, the fuse multiply add, and the, the, uh, the division square square root uh, operation. But more, more uh, also very important is the RISC-V uh, ISA compliance. So we have checked the models uh, against uh, ISA compliance. Um, how we've, we've done that, huh? so we, uh, uh, we have taken the uh, RISC-V compliance framework. We downloaded that from GitHub, and here you see the link. Um, and this framework compares arbitrary models against reference signatures. And currently, this uh, only covers the uh, 32 IMC unprivileged spec only uh, versions of the ISA. But um, uh, what we have done is that we have taken that uh, framework and uh, the different pieces of the framework are listed here in, in, in green. Huh? So uh, we have the test suites. We, you know, part of that is the GNU assembler. Uh, we have some uh, compare script, and then we conf compare against the reference, and then you have a pass fail. But what we did in this flow, we instantiated the AC designer generated ISS from the TRV32 model. We inserted that into this in this flow, and yeah, we pass. That's clear. Um, more. It's important to know that uh, ISA compliance uh, has not to be confused with uh, full RTL uh, verification. Um, RTL verification is much broader, uh, but at least uh, ISA, uh, ISA compliance is a subset of that. And that's what we have proven with this flow. And our customers uh, can uh, have access to these uh, uh, compliance checking flow uh, and, and scripts that we, we have prepared. Now, taking one step further, uh, one of the uh, aims for the RISC-V um, processor initiative is to have extensions. And um, as, as shown in the previous slides, uh, we have like uh, 12 different RISC-V models with 32 bit and 64 data, three and five stage pipelines, optional features like floating point. Uh, they are an ideal starting point, but Creating on top of that now extensions, that's where I will move in. First of all, we want to do the, let's say, uh, extensions of the data path that are connected to the same central register file, uh, register file that come with the RISC V uh, uh, models. So uh, with the SDX concept, we want to uh, give uh, the opportunity for to our customers to easily extend uh, the ISA with custom instructions with a kind of pre-modeled uh, instructions. So this SDX um, model, which it's a separate model, it's an additional model on, on top of the TRV, is uh, the TRV32 SDX. It comes with predefined extension instruction templates which are called XDX0 to XDXN. So there are like a handful of them or two handful of them. Uh, all these instructions have been pre-modeled in this SDX model. The Only the behavioral part of the instructions, as Mark has explained, the behavioral part of the instructions is part of the model. That is the only thing that needs to be impl implemented by the customer. But automatically, the compiler will automatically uh, exploit these additional instru instructions and intrinsics that the customer has then implemented. And as an example here on the right-hand side, I depicted or I, 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 I drafted a, a small behavioral model of an instruction that is doing uh, a dual 16-bit add. So this instruction, which is called SDX0, reads in two 32-bit 
values from the register file. Um, those are added, but they are added in you know two-way 16. Huh? So the lowest 16 bits are added and the highest 16 bits are added. And then the result is returned back to the register file. This is how simple uh, it is, how to describe the behavioral part of, of, of such an SDX instruction. And as on the software side, you can use this uh, SDX zero uh, uh, intrinsic as part of your software, but as a user, you can also assign an in, intuitive name it just by adding this one line, uh, this add to, uh, which is in fact identical to, yeah, from behavioral point of view, you can say this, is, this has to be to, to behave identical to the um, uh, SDX uh, instruction. And then uh, you will be able to use the add to intrinsic in your source code. So SDX comes in, in multiple variants here. Huh? Um, I will guide you through this. So you have three register instructions accessing 32-bit registers or 64-bit register pairs. So the X is the X for zero to four. Uh, it reads in two 32-bit registers and produces a 32-bit result. You can define any behavior uh, from on, on top of that. But we have the same versions where we have double register access. So in fact, the register pair is being accessed two times. So that means two 64-bit accesses resulting in a 64-bit result. And then that register pair is written back to the register file again. But then you have also accumulate variants of those uh, instructions that I explained above, where instead of only um, you know, reading RS1 and RS2, you will also be reading R RD, but also writing RD. That means that you have three reads and run write to the register file. You can that, have that also in the register pair mode, eh, where you have instead of 32-bit accesses, 64-bit accesses. That's, that's this one. And then you have variants where you can mix, you know, you can have 60-bit reads, 16-bit reads, and 64-bit writes. But then we have also versions where you have uh, like uh, uh, two 32-bit uh, reads uh, and a 32-bit write, but on top of that, two writes to two dedicated registers. Registers you cannot change or the compiler cannot choose. The compiler, you know, you know, the, the instruction will automatically write to X, also write to X24 and X25. Um, and of course, the compiler, the ASIC designer compiler will, will take that to in, into account. It will make sure that the inputs or that the, 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 the next instructions making use of those, uh, of the results of these instructions will, will access these uh, X24 and X25 uh, without uh, too much overhead. Um, then we have other variants where uh, instead of uh, only two of these accesses, we have four or eight of these accesses which can be read and write on top of the, the three registers that then can still be chosen by the compiler. So the RD, RS1, or RS2 can be chosen by the compiler, while the other ones are uh, dedicated. On top of that, you have then an immediate argument uh, that can be used as an input uh, to the instructions for, uh, and that can serve as an opcode. I'll have a, next, a good example on that on the next slide. Uh, following slide. So here uh, you see how the as the as the X instructions are encoded. They are all made part of the custom two range. So we map them all here. And on top of that, you see here the post modification load in custom zero, the post modification store in custom one, and then we have the zero overhead do loop uh, instruction, uh, which is part of custom three. So defining the behavior of the SDX instruction, that's what uh, I'm gonna explain here. So um, we have chosen SDX0A, uh, which is a 32-bit 30, three register instruction with accumulate. That means uh, the RD, you can read and write. And in this way, you can implement uh, a multiply add or a multiply subtract instruction. So we use the immediate argument to select between a multiply add or a multiply sub. So if the immediate is zero, this is the MAC. And here, if the immediate is one, you do the uh, 
uh, multiply subtract. How this is defined in PDG is in, in, in the NML and, and, and behavioral part of, 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 uh, of the SDX instruction that's described here. Uh, so you, you, you're taking three, uh, three registers, you're taking the immediate, and depending on the immediate, you do the multiply add or the multiply subtract. Um, and that is ready, you know, for the Asian designer compiler to be used. Uh, as of now on, if you have defined this behavior, the fsdx0a function, intrinsic function, can be used in your source code, as I have explained here. So there is no need to have uh, inline assembly or to, um, so it's it just uh, using the intrinsic function call uh, that can be used by the, the software program. And of course, there is an immediate update of the SDK, the compiler, the simulator, the RTL, uh, the on-chip debug uh, behavior, that all is uh, following if you just made uh, the, the simple changes as depicted here. A couple of application examples uh, on, on uh, the SDX. Uh, you have, we, we come with uh, three uh, different examples application examples. One is the FFT, where we implemented three different instructions. You have the FX1 instruction, which does a complex fixed point multiplication and scaling. You have an, an absolute function doing an absolute value of a complex value, a complex value in this case consisting out of 16-bit real, 16-bit imaginary packed into a 32-bit register. And then we have a butterfly operation, which makes use of the SDX5 instruction uh, which does two uh, reads, one uh, destination, and on top of that, uh, it uses the X25 and X24 reg dedicated registers. The result is when running your FFT application, you have a speed up of a factor of over you know, 280% at only an area increase of 31%. A similar example is a, a SHA-256 application where uh, we uh, compute the hash of a message using bitwise and or XOR operations and shift operations. In this case, you need to have, you need to have to store the state uh, of the machine in eight variables, eh? eight different registers. And therefore we use the SDX7 uh, instruction, which uses these eight external, uh, no, ex eight uh, dedicated uh, registers in the register file. Yeah, so the state registers are here labeled from uh, XA to XH. You have the, the hardware with the AND source and, 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 and logic operations in the char step. And in the same cycle, so it's a, a read, modify, write. In the same cycle, the result is written, or the new state is written back again by the char step uh, function uh, to, to the registers again. Another nice example is keyword spotting, uh, where we did uh, uh, an, a small size neural network of 3.3 million max. There we make use of a feature which is PactSIMD. We, we use a 32 bit register container to store four times eight bit values, as depicted here. And we use register pairs to enabling 64 bit accesses. Because if, for instance, you want to do a, a MAC operation on, on, on these uh, four times eight bit, your accumulator will need to be wider than 8-bit. In this case, we have chosen 16-bit, and then we have uh, packed the four accumulators of 16-bit. We packed it in a 64-bit uh, container, uh, where we then use the double size or the register pair um, variants of the SDX instructions to, to do an operation. In this case, for instance, a, a vector MAC, where the mode would be the immediate that steer the, uh, the the let's say the, the type of operation that is being done on, on, on the, the two inputs. Uh, but then at the end of your MAC operations or your series of MAC operations, you need to store it back to 8-bit values. And then we added a, a VQ set instruction that then does the rounding and saturation for the from the four times 16 bit into again uh, a 32 bit uh, packed 8 bit CMD uh, container. Speed up 1,160% at an area increase of, of 16%. Anyway, with uh, SDX, um, you have the possibility in an easy way 
to uh, extend your risk v with uh, rather simple data path extensions. Um, uh, however, you have limitations with SDX. Huh? You, uh, the memories, memory ports, addressing modes, they are fixed. The register structure is, is fixed. Um, you have application specific types and operations, but they are limited to 32 bit and 64 data types. Uh, you have SIMD, which can be packed SIMD in, in four times eight or four times 16 bit. You have instruction level parallelism you cannot exploit in SDX. You need, you know, it, it's risk, uh, risk operation. You know, you do a load, you do a store, you do an operation, but not uh, nothing in parallel. Um, and um, on the specialized control flow instructions, also those are fixed. Also the pipeline is fixed. However, if you move to a complete uh, NML modeling, you take, uh, you, you, you take uh, the, the full capabilities of ACIP designer, you have flexibility on all these architectural features. You can make and customize your processor or DSP to, in the way you want. So that brings me to the final part of the presentation, which is the um, um, going further away from RISC-V uh, effect moving away from standard uh, from standard risk 5 isa there you can uh, there you can implement with ACP design you can implement extensions which uh, which are far more dedicated huh? so uh, you can have uh, custom units with dedicated register file uh, special uh, vector uh, data paths uh, additional memories, custom addressing modes, and you can have even instruction level parallelism. And these, uh, uh, this one, uh, this example, I, I will show in, uh, in in the next example, which is called TMOBI, which is also an ACIP example that comes for free with the ACIP designer tool. There we show the functionality of four-way ILP uh, with a vector data path um, of uh, SIMD64, each lane containing an eight by eight to 32 bit uh, Mac uh, multiply pad. Uh, so eight by eight multiply accumulation in 32 bits. You have additional memories, uh, additional weight memories. You have vector addressing. Now what we have done here is we have been implementing a mobile net V3 application based on TensorFlow code, which we converted into C and the main function uh, implements the graph, it does the memory co uh, copies, and it invokes the kernels. And the kernels that we really accelerated here in this example is our, our 2D convolution kernels, depth-wise convolution kernels, vector adds, um, average pooling, softmax uh, uh, activation functions. And this is the, the, the architecture that came out. So this is a four slot uh, VLIW where the first slot is Risk five, so you could say this is Risk five inspired, but it's not Risk five compliant anymore, because we added uh, very dedicated extensions. Yeah? So the the first slot is the plain TRV thirty uh, two Risk five uh, slot uh, scaler, but then we added a vector data path with uh, vector register files, different vector register files of different sizes and different depths. And of course, the vector MAC unit as depicted here with a, with a vector MUL and a vector add operation. But then we added two special dedicated uh, vector, um, vector load store units with uh, custom AGUs, 2D AGUs to uh, do the, the load and stores of the input data and the weight data. But that results in a substantial performance in, in if you look back here to the mobile net v3 application, you see the different layers of the uh, mobile net v3 uh, graph uh, horizontally, and then the cycle count it takes. Um, if we run the mobile net v3 on a TRV32 P3 plane risk five, it takes like three billion cycles, while the T mobile reduces that to 8.5 million cycles which is a speed up of 360x. So this is really substantial. But how, what brings that on, brings, where brings us that on the area side? So we synthesized uh, this core huh, because AC Designer generates the RTL. Uh, we synthesized in 28 nanometers, 600 megahertz. 
And we ended up uh, with a, a gate count of 590k gates. While if we synthesize the uh, TRV32P3 playing risk 5, we end up with roughly 30k. So it's only 20 times larger. And then, yeah, where is the area spent? Obviously, it's spent in the vector data path. Huh? So the, 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 the vector multiply, the vector accumulation, that's where the majority of the area is spent, while the remainder part is, 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 is minor. Yeah. Of course, there is some, some areas still spent uh, in, in the, the vector AGUs and stuff like that. But the vector data, you cannot hide the max. The max, whether you go for an ACIP solution or you're going for an RTL solution, you will have to spend the max. Anyway, this gives you uh, another example, another reference point on where ACIP designer can bring you if you deviate further from what is plain risk five. And for sure, the performance you can get there is substantially higher than uh, remaining close to the uh, risk five ISA. But the risk five ISA is a perfect uh, ISA to be part of the scalar part of any uh, vector core as here uh, uh, explained in, in the TMOB example. So that brings me to the end. Um, I'm handing it over back to um, to Marcus for the final conclusions. Uh, thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Patrick. Um, now, closing up on, on this presentation, a few slides to summarize. Um, this ACIP solution that we have presented to you is very well proven in the industry. It's used by the majority of ten, to, the top 10 semiconductor companies in a wide range of applications or in a wide range of domains, the domain, be it automotive, be it network, be it wireline, be it medical, um, high performance computing. So the concept is not restricted to a domain, but it's widely um, applied. So we have hundreds of tables with our customers. So a few success stories uh, to, to illustrate. So ST, for example, um, applies the concept um, of domain specific processes and they're using ACIP Designer as their tool of choice for rapid um, development of such custom processors. In the area of risk 5 um, a very more recent uh, press release here from NSI Tech in Japan who are using ACIP Designer to quickly explore uh, multiple options, quickly coming up with the software development kit for their tailored multi-core architecture. In summary, ACID Designer is all about accelerating the design and programming of domain-specific processors. It gives you the automated way to hardware and the SDK, which is crucial. So the SDK should not be underestimated. Because we have a compiler in the early stages of any design process, this compiler in the loop process allows for rapid architectural exploration, helping you to come up with the right architecture. And in the, uh, we can serve then the software development community also with a professional software development kit, um, because that's also, you don't only, not only want to design a good processor, but you also you want to enable your um, uh, software teams then to use it efficiently. All that is covered with AC Designer. With AC Designer, you have no architectural constraints. We have described example models here and, and processor models, which are ready to use but they're written in NML. So you have the full freedom to modify all of this and come up with your innovation. You can optimize for the right PPA number for your specific application. We have a proven track records of hundreds of tape outs, even with the most advanced notes. And um, I would almost bet that any of you will have a device uh, that has um, uh, some kind of ACIP designed with our tools in one way or the other. So with this, I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. And um, I'm looking forward to our discussions and questions um, either at the panel or um, simply drop me an email so we can follow up on this one. Thank you very much.